There you go. And so uh, this is going to be emailed to everybody on Friday morning. We're going to put together a competent follow up. I don't even know what I'm going to kind of put together because I think this could go, you know, in a number of different directions. And that not, is not necessarily a bad thing, but this is truly designed to be interactive, not just a presentation at you guys. Um, so with that, um, I will let David, I'll, I'll let David kind of quarterback this thing. Thank you guys so much for joining us each and every week. You know, we're coming down to the end of our 2021 schedule with these three, three, remember, trainings that we're going to do kind of all interlinked together. So please stay tuned with us each Wednesday, all the way through the uh, 15th of December, because there's going to be exciting things each and every week. But thank you guys so much for your participation on the weekly webinar series. It's been a complete success from all of us at the Snap One Partner Stores. Thank you very much. David, I'm going to turn it over to you, buddy. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. I guess I get to follow your boundless energy, so I'm going to do, I'm going to do my best to back that up. <laughs> um, but thanks, everyone, for joining. Yeah, we're super excited about this. You, you, yeah, I'm going to hand it over to Matt in a second to give a quick introduction, but let me tell you why we're doing this. You know, we um, we have this incredible passion and love for all everything audio um, at Snapbite and for our partners here on the screen um, who will be uh, uh, picking their brains and diving into some really fun topics very shortly. Um, but what we wanted to do really is, is give you, you all the confidence to see that, hey, you know, these guys are passionate about audio. They know what they're talking about. They've got the goods. They've got the products um, that, can, that can fulfill the needs of the customers. And um, I think you're going to find here today that you're going to love what these guys have to say. So, um, Matt, I'm going to pass it over to you for, for a little brief intro. Yeah, appreciate intro. it. Thank you. We stole some of my words there, so I'm going to have to work around that a little bit. But. Now, um, as, as Dave said, as Gary said, thank you everybody for attending the webinar today. Thank you for, for everybody who's participating in the webinar. We've got a fantastic group of panelists here. Um, as Gary and Dave have both said, um, a little bit different format than normal. We're not gonna do a presentation. This is more of a conversation. So if you have questions, comments, ideas, thoughts, you know, please, please drop those in the chat, drop them in the Q&A. Uh, we'll try and cover those either today or uh, possibly in a future session as well. Um, we are super, super excited to talk about home theaters today, uh, especially as we get into the holiday season, um, because you've got a panel of uh, very enthusiastic and passionate audio people here. Um, I, I'm Matt Camp. I um, manage our audio business and the product management organization at Snap. Um, and really, it's my job to think about audio all day, every day. Um, that's that's what I do. Um, and at the end of the day, everybody enjoys great sound. Um, and it's our belief that um, everybody should have access to that. Um, and, you know, again, specifically around the holidays, you know, music and movies can really bring families. It can bring communities together uh, and it allows everybody to really share in something special. In addition to the fact that it's it's enjoyable, um, it's also really good for your businesses. Um, there's actually a, a CE Pro study that was published um, this past year where it cited that uh, nearly 60% of you saw growth in your home theater business um, in 2021, and you actually expect that to continue uh, moving forward. So really exciting um, there as well. So uh, it's our belief at Snap One that um, you guys should have access to all these products. So we've built and curated the best audio solutions or what we believe to be the best audio solutions in the market. Um, again, because music and movies sound better when you have great audio solutions. Um, so Snap One is really your one-stop shop for all of your audio and home cinema needs. Um, and it's our objective for this session um, to make sure that everybody gets comfortable with specking and installing home theaters, uh, exploring some of the products and solutions that we have here to offer at Snap One. Uh, and so with that, um, we hope that this helps um, you know, your home theater journey. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to the real experts, uh, starting with Adam. Hey, before, before we dive in, can we just do a quick round of introductions? We had a comment in the chat that was like, hey, hang on a second, who are you guys? <laughs> so so let, let's, let's do that quickly. So I'll go first. My name's Dave Phillips. I work here at Snap One. I've been here 11 years. Um, I started in the 90s in hi-fi shops selling um, high-end audio gear. I moved into the install world, started programming control systems and lighting systems, then moved into a distribution company. Uh, we sold very high-end home theater equipment. So I was in technical sales. Um, and for the last 11 years, I've been, I've been here at Snap One. So um, that's me. Uh, Adam, do you want to go next? Yeah, uh, I'm uh, Adam Hauser, regional sales manager with KEF. I've uh, been in the industry since 2004, uh, primarily uh, always with audio, always with home theater, home theater design, specification, engineering. And um, yeah, bounced around all over. Been a dealer, been an installer, been a manufacturer, been a distribution. Uh, been a rep. 
Nice, brilliant. Um, Alvin. Alvin Clement, I've been with Klipsch now for just over 20 years. I know I don't look like it, but it's been 20 years, sadly. Uh, started in Hi-Fi just out of high school uh, and worked in integration and retail uh, before coming to Klipsch. So uh, audio in the blood. Uh, and uh, just like Adam, uh, the cool thing about being on the dealer side first, right, before even coming from a manufacturer side is we are just full of solutions way before uh, they're even asked. And uh, no, I'm looking forward to the panel in general. It's going to be a lot of fun today. Oh, thanks, Alvin. Brilliant. Um, Seth? Well, well, with that, man, I mean, we all have the same story. That's no fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I started the uh, same thing on a, you know, on a sales floor selling uh, high-end products, uh, high-end audio specifically, because uh, like, you know, like Matt alluded to, not only is it grow your business, but it's, it's just more fun than light bulbs and shades. So may turn the turn knobs to the right and make things uh, play loud. So yeah, I came from that same world, um, and I've been on the uh, the the dealer side. No, excuse me, not the dealer side. The uh, the uh, the manufacturing side since about 2015. So I also am looking forward to telling some uh, some war stories uh, and how we can uh, help you solve some of the woes it is in designing audio systems and delivering the best quality solution for your customers. We no, have the trick. We got them all. Thanks, Seth. Love it. Um, so yeah, Adam, you, um, you're going to talk us through a little bit about qualifying the sale. Um, do you want to take it away? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, and yeah, that's what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to talk about uh, qualifying questions, some design questions, perhaps some objections. And I want to start off with just a couple uh, little, little things to kind of get your mind rolling, get you guys kind of thinking about what it is uh, I'll be talking about for the next few minutes. Uh, great theater, great home theater, great home cinema is an experience. It's not a thing. Uh, a customer who wants a home theater isn't trying to just buy a thing. They want to buy an experience. Um, another little pointer that I love bringing up to dealers is, you know, we, we talk about not selling out of your wallet, selling that experience, let the experience dictate the cost. And a pointer I love making out is, you know, how much does a watch cost? How much does a car cost? How much does a house cost? These are questions that just can't be answered unless you ask more qualifying questions to determine what it is uh, that person or customer is looking for. Uh, one of the largest issues we see with people who are designing or selling a theater is they haven't started off by asking qualifying questions. They dive right into selling the technological side of the theater. They wanna start selling a projector, start selling speakers, start selling amps. And they haven't asked what experience that customer is looking for and what it is the experience they want to achieve. Uh, and this is where those qualifying questions come in and why they're just so darn important. Uh, so to get very technical on this, I'll kind of give you guys the best definition I could find of a qualifying question, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, and it's going to be tailored a bit to home theater, what it is we're actually selling here. So a qualifying question is intended to surface important information that will help you design the desired experience for your client. Uh, qualifying questions are fact-finding missions. You're looking to figure out what it is to achieve their goal, and so you can maximize your efforts. By asking better questions, you don't have to work as hard. Uh, in, in my experience since, since 2004, I, I would say that the qualifying questions are actually the most in part, important part of the sale or any project uh, far and above everything else. Um, I, I won't say that the asking the wrong qual qualifying questions or not asking them completely or, uh, or not even asking them at all won't lead to a good sale or a happy customer, but asking the right qualifying questions will certainly lead to you most likely exceeding their expectations. You'll find that you were able to exceed maybe the budget the customer had in mind even more often, you'll exceed the budget you had in mind. You know, we walk up to the customer's home, we judge their car, we judge their house, we're reading, judging the book by its cover. But if we ask the right qualifying questions, we may find that uh, very often so, uh, the project's actually worth more than we even thought it was. Um, so he, to kind of reiterate again, why are these qualifying questions so important? It, it, it's because they tell, you know, they tell us what 
the client is feeling and thinking about what they want to do. It's their emotions they're answering questions with, not resolutions, not Dolby Atmos. They're, they're telling you what they want to experience. And these are the answers they're giving you are all to all based on things they knew ahead of time. You didn't give them the ideas about a projector or a TV or surround sound. This is what they knew ahead of time coming in. So you, you learn so much about what their experience is with home theater, home cinema with these questions. Even though all of us here pretty much sell technology, the feelings and thoughts on these customers are not based on technology. They're based on the experience they want technology to give them. No one buys a speaker saying, I want a speaker that can play up to you know, 25,000 hertz. No, they want a speaker that can give them goosebumps. That's the technical aspect they're looking to purchase. Uh, so there's no specs, no pricing, no cost, just purely experience, which is totally priceless when it comes to these uh, qualifying questions. So qualifying questions do have a general form that we'll quickly touch on. They should be open-ended. We don't want questions that have yes or no answers. We want questions that make the client think and dive into what it is they're looking for. We want to draw out emotion. Uh, don't ask a client, hey, do you watch movies in here? No, ask, what's your favorite kind of movie? What's the first movie you want to watch in here when we get it finished? Uh, have your qualifying questions. Go from broad to more specific as you dive deeper. Uh, how do you want the room to feel is a great way to start. Getting down in you know, later and later questions, how many people do you want to have join you in your theater? You know, how many people are in your family you'd like to have in here at once, getting more specific as you go down? All of these questions provide us with answers that'll let us know what the client overall is trying to achieve. They make the client vocalize their desires and their expectations. They make you vocalize what it is you can do and what it is you can create for your customer. So now both of you, both you and your client have expectations on the overall experience you should be able to create. Now we're gonna move from those qualifying questions and dive into how do we take those qualifying questions and actually design a theater based around those qualifying questions. You ask your customer, well, how do you want the room to feel? Uh, right away, this will give you details. Uh, they, do they just wanna paint the walls and call it a day or do they wanna put columns up, put fabric up, have acoustics, do they want a star ceiling? It's giving you a general idea of how much they really wanna get into this. Uh, one of my favorite nerdy little questions, is this a room with a TV or a TV room? Is this a room where there just happens to be video, happens to be a theater, but you're doing other things as well? It's where the kids do their homework, or it's where you play ski ball in the back. Or is this a dedicated theater where we come in here to watch media, we watch content in this room, and that's the, the main or only focus? Uh, have you seen a room or a theater that you thought was amazing, that gave you goosebumps, that really made you say, hey, I want that experience? They'll probably pull up their, their Pinterest, or they'll pull up Instagram and show you pictures of things they want. If they pull up a picture of a gorgeous room with oak and speakers everywhere and star ceiling, they know that's expensive. They know their budget is going to be a lot bigger than maybe they had planned before. Or they're going to find out very soon. <laughs> very soon. Yes, yes, they are. <laughs> and then the last, yeah. the last thing on the, the questions, one question should not be, what's your budget at this point? We want to let the experience drive them to their destination to where we can inform them, okay, you want the oak walls, you want the columns, you want the acoustics, you want the latest and greatest surround sound. Your room's 20 by 50. Guess what? It's going to be over, you know, $150,000 based on the, you know, what you told me you want for an experience. They may go, sure, great, awesome. Or it might go, oh, okay, we need to back off a little bit. Get to the experience first before you start diving into budget questions. Let them state what they want to accomplish, then discuss budget because you can say to them, well, the reason the price is this much is because I wanted to give you the experience you were looking for and potentially exceed it as well. So when you take these design questions, you, you, I'm sorry, you take these qualifying questions and now we can get into the design questions. Uh, if your customer, when you ask the customer, uh, you know, hey, how do you want the room to look? And they say, well, I want the biggest image I can possibly get. But they also say they wanted floor standing speakers. Well, now in these design questions, you can say, well, hey, that's great. If let's, let's do your whole front wall as the picture, but we're going to need to take your floor standing speakers and put them behind an acoustically transparent screen. So we're going to design it like this. So now you know you have the budget for a bigger screen, bigger projector. You have a, a budget now for an acoustically transparent screen, which means I can hide subwoofers and things behind it as well. So I've created designs based on their needs. Um, 
asking a customer, hey, you know, what's your favorite movie or what's your favorite type of movie? I had a customer recently who actually said their Marvel movies were their favorite. They went and did uh, the Marvel movies at the theater that took like four days to watch all of them all at once. And I said, well, if you're a Marvel fan, you have to have Dolby Atmos in your theater. So we need to put speakers on the side, speakers in the real and rear and speakers in the ceiling. Let's point out the locations where they need to go. Selling a you know 11 channel system was sold because they love Marvel movies, not because they wanted Dolby Atmos. Right. And that's Yo, again if, where- If I can jump in real quick, cause I don't want to miss sure. it uh, to back up what you're saying. That acoustic screen point you just made is massive for like acoustic nerds like myself because mm -hmm. when you have an acoustic screen you don't have to use those horizontal centers Correct. i can get you a big badass center channel tower right behind that screen now i'm gonna have to sacrifice anything for that so big well, props all, to the acoustic screen all the brands that snap one offers all offer speakers that can be purchased in singles as well so now you can actually use a tower speaker or an in-wall speaker as a matching center. So your left center and right are actually all the identical same speakers. And that's where you really get an amazing home cinema experience. Not to mention the center is actually behind the screen where it belongs. So vocals are actually really coming out of the screen. Uh, so all of these things kind of blend together for the client to tell you the experience they're looking for, allowing you to kind of dictate the design based on their experience. And by doing this, you'll always find the budgets increased, the experience is increased, and you know generally everybody's gonna be happy. But oh, by the way, you overcome almost all the objections of the client if you base it on what experience they're looking for. If they say, I want a star ceiling, and you go, okay, well, it starts off at $2,500, and they go, nah, never mind. Well, there's not an objection there. They're just saying, hey, I don't wanna spend that much money on it, so I'm not gonna do it. If they say, oh, well, that's what it costs, then I guess that's what it costs. Objections are completely molded differently when you base it on experience. We, I'm guessing all of us have probably been to Disney World. Maybe some of us have been there with kids. Little kid wants the uh, Mickey Mouse ice cream cone. It's like $7 a piece. You're going to end up getting it because they want the experience. Right. And that's, uh, well, you want to make your kid happy, right? Like, yep, yep. <laughs> but that's kind of, um, obviously, this is a much longer section, but I want to make sure everybody has enough time to cover what they want to cover as well. Uh, that's my kind of my poignancies on some of the uh, uh, qualifying questions, as well as design questions based on the qualifying. No, I, I love how you started that, Adam. Honestly, the, the, it's, as much on the retail side as we had, because all of our integrators that are here and listening and that are, are pitching to an, a homeowner that are asking those kind of mm -hmm. questions or that, that you really don't have a, a whole lot of guides to help them besides the, maybe the car that they drove up in that they're meeting you somewhere or the mm -hmm. house that you're meeting them at or something, right? We're trying to quantify, you know, what, is this a million dollar opportunity or is, is this a home theater in a box, which would mm -hmm. pray to God is not that. You know, we, we, we don't know. <laughs> well, that's it. We don't know what that's going to be. And the, only, and the only way we can truly find it is based on goosebumps. Oh, sure. No. Um, that, and, you know, finding out they're a movie guy or, or, a, or a music guy, right? What's the last concert that you were able to attend or your, what's your favorite concert? What's your favorite movie or your last movie? I haven't been in the movies in 10 years, but I want a place to be able to do it. You're like, well, is that more of a music guy? Because you're qualifying what their experience level needs to be. I mean, I, I did just see a concert. I watched Stained, right? Which is one of I just did not more than a month ago. And it was absolutely insane. And I want to replicate that in, in my theater. That's what I wanted to do. You're like, well, okay. That's, that, that's, a, that's on the top end of the experience level. And to be able to get that, right? That's the whole level of experience for us to be able to do but we can quantify it. We can at least turn it around going, all right, well, that is more on the, that, the ABC that we're, that we're trying to provide that, that, uh, the homeowner. So if it's a good, better, best type of opportunity that I highly suggest for everyone. So again, we don't go back in our, in our pocketbook or their pocketbook and say, well, that's a hundred grand. We're at, at 50 grand or even at 20 grand. This is, this is what you're getting at those levels. So by that time frame, they have an understanding if a star ceiling really is 2,500 bucks or more and they're going, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't know. I, I saw the picture on Instagram to your point, which I love. They saw it. I want that. I need somebody to help me understand, you know, what that costs because there's a big difference in a Mercedes and a Pinto. Here's the dollar amount, right? A little bit to be able to get there. The, to other, to about that. the other thing that I love about that, Adam, is that this, this will oftentimes lead you to a successful install. 
right? When you get done with the project, you've met the expectations, right? Because you started off with what do you want to see? And, and I always say audio is a very subjective thing. And it's kind of like wine tasting, right? If somebody tells you what they want, and then you give them what they want, and then they experience that, they're going to experience what they've told you they wanted to experience because you've given them what they've asked for. And so I think that oftentimes leads to, you know, a happy customer or a happy client, you know, based on the, the qualifying criteria set up front, as opposed to, you know, trying to meet a price point and then, you know, fill a space with sound based on that price point. You don't know that you're going to meet that emotional expectation. And like you talked about um, from the theater space, I think that's, that's fantastic. Well, and if I can just touch real quick, um, uh, one of the questions was uh, discussing, you know, multiple subwoofers. And, uh, you know, so many people lead with one single subwoofer. If you, if you talk to somebody uh, about experience, you're, and especially in a theater room, you're never going to mention one subwoofer. You're going to, I mean, the room behind me, I think has 18 subwoofers. So, you know, you're, you're going to be able to create a system that, that meets the needs that they have. So you're never going to just have one subwoofer in a room. It's always going to be at least two, if not four, six, whatever. Hey, one of the um, one of the questions I had a, a lot of success with um, when I was selling home theatre was, where do you sit in a commercial theatre? If you go if you go to the movies, where do you like to sit? Is it the front or is it the back or is it the middle? And that gave me a lot of clues on uh, on the experience they were looking for. You know, the size of the screen relative to the seating that they're sitting in, and um, just the kind of completely enveloped in the experience or the kind of the sitting back, you know, right at the back with a, with a much smaller uh, relative image size. So, um, but that was one of the questions here. So what- I've never heard that before. I was like, oh, all right. Well, that, huh. good point in the perspective, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, um, what other questions have you guys come across uh, that helps with qualifying home theater sales? Uh, is it safe to listen to 18 subwoofers uh, for extended periods of time? That's the one that I <laughs> a great question. Yes, it very much so is. <laughs> uh, no, the multiple subwoofer question that I get all the time is always a question of, of why. Like, why do I need this? And it's a, it's always a fun answer. You're like, you don't need any of this, guy. Like, this is this is not a world of needs. This is a this is a world of wants. But when you get into the acoustics of it, to to dive deep into uh, the question that was asked. Um, if you just place one subwoofer in a room and walk around that room with like a big heavy bass track, you're going to feel spots in the room where it's weaker. That's a big no. And you're going to find spots where the room is a little too bassy and it's a little bit overpowering. So what we call those peaks. I call, it, I call them suck outs because it basically sucks out of the room and then peaks. You can solve the peaks with a lot of the, uh, the EQing software that's built into the product that I'm going to talk about later, but you can't solve the nulls. There's nothing you can do. All you're going to do is raise the bass levels, but that's the acoustics of that room. A second subwoofer solves that null and you know, it avoids that uncomfortable situation where the customer has to choose between either having less bass or moving seats so they don't want to move or rearranging the room. Just add a second subwoofer and it solves a lot of those nulls, about half of them if we're getting technical. Uh, the, the other thing on that, Seth, is that um, the more seats you have in a theater that you want to have a uniform sound a unit or like a predictable experience in all of them um you need more subs um to cancel out those uh what did you call them suck outs the, the, the suck, yeah. Yeah. suck outs is my term that's not I know, that's a new one to me i don't know if that's in a written down anywhere but i like it <laughs> um so yeah adding subwoofers helps to give more predictable uniform base across a larger area and so you know are you the are you the type of customer who wants one hot seat you know the single seat in a 20 by 30 room and that's it um or are you going to have family and friends over often um and the more seats the more subs and, we've all had only, oh, go oh, sorry, well we've all had the dealer who who you know quotes a 10 inch sub and then the client's not happy with the base so they spec a 12 inch sub 15 inch sub and it never gets any better it's because it's not a size issue it's a placement or quantity issue mm -hmm. yeah we're, we're fortunate that our software today, right, and the, most of our receivers, at least that they're built anywhere in the last two years, being that we, it's difficult to find them as it is today, but at least sub-correction, the software being used a lot today can actually remove the phasing characteristics of that room, maximize it, so when we can get, do two plus. Two is still ideal for, for any room I mean, acoustically, but the, in the old days, you literally had to take the sub in different areas of the room and place it just to be able to go back and listen. You're like, what? 
oh, well, over here, that acoustics of the room, I'm losing all of my sub where I'm trying to sit. We, we've all used enough of them where we're taking the microphone back to where we sit to be able to utilize it. But on the on the woofer side, we've never been able to utilize those dynamics to be able to find it and actually listen to it that the to make sure we're not going to get the boominess. I mean, that we're, yeah. I want that in the entire room, right? How can you maximize it besides more than by at least one? Now, I think it's important. Real world um, scenarios that I ran into selling to customers when I was talking about multiple subs and, and still run into, you're going to have the customer that, you know, in all these conversations that we're having right now about peaks and nulls and getting everything set up correctly, that's all the conversation you can have when someone gives you an objection about, well, I don't need all that base. It's not about more. It's about getting even coverage. The second part is, well, I don't want to spend that much more money. I don't know if I can do two subs. If, if I'm designing a system and I have a choice between one really good 12 inch sub or two really good 10 inch subs, saving the customer money, I'm choosing those two 10 inch subs every yep. single time. I'm always going to go with the either less powerful or low or smaller size multiple sub with orientation because it just gives me that much more control. So now you've taken that price objection out of the equation for the customer. It's not about getting more money out of them. It's about, you know, doing what's right by the space. The benefit is the just psychology of a buyer that we all know. No one wants to lose anything. So while they may groan about buying two subs and it comes down to, okay, well, I'm not going to spend more money, but I'm getting smaller subs. Ah, screw it. Just give me the big ones and we're done. You just made a whole bunch more money and it was right by the customer. So don't be afraid to offer multiples. It's the right thing to do. Taking care of most. And it's still moving air though, right? And there is no replacement for displacement. That is a fact. So when it comes to any room, I've got to be able to make sure I can move the most amount of air to get that even response. It's just I love that, that saying. No, no, dis, no replacement for displacement. Um, so true. Uh, hey, this might be a I've good only time. Ever, to... I've only ever heard that for muscle cars. I, I like that. I'm stealing that. <laughs> hey, Alvin, this might be, um, sounds like a good time just to switch over and for you to give us a quick run through of the, the different audio components in our home theater while we're talking about subwoofers. It, then this goes really back to where Adam was talking about when we we're trying to qualify, right? Because for any customer or if, if they're floor standing speakers, in ceiling speakers, a, a lot of it has to do with room acoustic, as well as being able to find what their overall application wants to look like. Uh, if they've got a, a photo they want to use, you have basic components, right? For any be able to be able to have a surround sound system, I need five speakers minimum. Uh, we were talking earlier about multiple subwoofers. They're traditionally used if it's a 5.1, that would be five speakers. If that's one center channel, two front speakers, two rear speakers, and your subwoofer being the 0.1. Uh, there's up to 12.4 if you want to go to that level with four subwoofers, et cetera. But the, the basic understanding for any customer is to make sure we, we have to have a qualified center channel where 70% of our dialogue, right, our left surround, our right surround, and two rear surrounds. That's all going to be dictated based on the size of that room. If it's a 20 by 20, if it's a over a garage, if it's going to be a 20 by 50 is what Adam was suggesting earlier, we're going to have to have lots of surrounds, right? We're going back to that feeder design of what a real cinema is going to be and how we can tether those rears to do so. But you're having to ask that customer the same thing. What do we want to install in ceiling speakers, right? That's our most margin. That's our most control. That's going to give us the, the most amount of directivity if it's going to be an Atmos theater, if we're going to expand. I have lots of control. And most importantly, we go back to that same area of it. It's very easy to choose whether it's going to be, a, say, a six and a half inch speaker or an eight inch speaker. Uh, but multiple levels, you start there first. Whether your experience level brings you back to, I only use eight inch in ceiling speakers. That's, that's my favorite. That's, that's what I do. Great. You speak about how that's going to be utilized. Um, an eight inch in ceiling is going to give you a little bit better base response than a six and a half. Again, we go back to that displacement thing. It's a little bit larger, so it's going to have a little bit frequent, a little bit better frequency response to reach down to those levels you want to use for. And more importantly, you have ultimate control. Uh, all of us make uh, product that's going to have the ability of, of aiming itself to some degree, whether it's an Atmos like a tower where it's designed to deflect off the ceiling. So you get lots of reflective properties there. 
or if it's going to be more in ceiling based where I have, again, ultimate control to fire it down to whatever level that I'm looking for. Same thing for my rear surrounds. Uh, that goes back to the same kind of concept to where you're inside that customer's home. He didn't tell you that he had a, a room that was already built, right? That let's say it's a two-story house. You know, you can't get above the ceiling there. So let's make it a little bit easier for yourself before you're suggesting a design where we're going to use bookshelves or floor standing speakers, because you've got to be looking at that first, right? I, I know he may want that star ceiling, but if it's a star ceiling simultaneously with a room that's already finished into a house, that's say a retro job, where it's already complete, your installation labor is going to go through the roof. You can do it. You just need to make sure you're qualifying that first. Um, what I love about Snapboard in general, no matter what brand you're choosing, if it's your grandfather's Bose, right, to today's uh, products that you've been listening to, it's more of a technology question. If you're loving horn-loaded speakers, direct radiating speakers, omnidirectional speakers, Snap One has some sort of component that can do anything you want it to do if you're asking the right questions and if you're more importantly telling us the kind of solution that you're needing it for. If we're looking at an exterior wall uh, where it's a new construction home uh, and he, customer wants to use M walls, you already know that you've got very minimal depth there. So an M wall speaker is going to be difficult for you to do. You need to be thinking about on wall. All these things need to be going through your head first before they're looking for a home theater experience and your design isn't going to be something that's going to be easily done. So it's looking at those small components first. Everything that you can utilize here at Snap One does have something for it. So it can keep a similar um, horn direct radiator speaker configuration. I mean, where it can be on wall, it can be outdoor design where it's more of a box style product. Um, Snap One sells a lot of commercial product also. So it's based in the cinema world or the professional world here as well. So the, the ability to change that design is easy. It, it just comes down to, again, more what the, the demand of that room is going to need. Receivers, right? Everything has to have an amplifier. Whether it is a, an, a receiver, AVR, audio video receiver, 5.1, 7.1, um, how many channels do you need is going to be dictated based on what the solution is going to need. Is, is the customer trying to utilize a pair of outdoor speakers as a secondary solution uh, to be able to run off of another amplifier off of the app that they're using on their same smartphone. All those products are available at Snap One today. You've got to be asking those questions. The, where are they looking for their secondary source of, of audio? I was a big, don't laugh, I was a big bathroom guy, right? Where are you spending every day that you're getting ready for, for your day is in the bathroom. That should be a primary zone for you to have in, in your audio system in your home. That's a way of pitching that because they're in there every day, whether they're using a Bluetooth speaker, whether they're utilizing something they're buying today, that there's a way of networking that to have a simple solution in their bathroom where they can listen to their Christmas music because we're in the middle of that today. Qualifying that's super important, asking those questions right in the middle of it. You, you definitely want to not turn over any opportunity. Outdoor and the bathroom were always a guarantee in your zones, always. But you had to ask because that, that, they didn't even know it's available. What do you mean? You can you can put something in my bathroom? Absolutely. There are single source products that we make today where you've got two different tweeters for wide dispersion that are weatherized that can be in a single bathroom or we can do as Seth suggested do a subwoofer and a full 2.1 solution in there too. You can do whatever you want. So you've got full functionality based on what level of, if they're a more music related or, or, or movie. Um, subwoofers, we talked about having multiples, answered a little, most of everyone's questions, I'm assuming, out of the gate. Making sure it's a newer AVR. If that customer has an audio video receiver they've had for a decade, right, which is where most of us started selling these products, finding out, finding out what that is out of the gate is super important because it will not have the software, the ability of working in today's environment. You're going to need something that's going to have full functionality on CEC, uh, and HDMI to configure to that monitor they may already have or they're trying to buy. I mean, the, the more they're doing and buying for a fresh install, the better. Ideally, don't use any of the older product that they may have stored over the last two or three decades because everybody's got old speakers. It's easy to do. Or old amplifiers. Amplifiers are the worst. Um, a basic configuration for a home theater is super important. 
Uh, we talked about exterior wall out of the beginning. Let's say there's a fireplace. Customer wants to buy a 70 inch or 60 inch LED. You're trying to do a pair of outdoor speakers or exterior on wall speakers that can be mounted for your front channels. No problem, easily done. In ceiling speakers in the rear, also easily done. But there's a problem with the center channel. Like, well, can I make it a, a 4.1 with those four channels and, and that subwoofer? With a modern receiver, yes, there is a phantom option to be able to turn that off and still take the dialogue and move it outward. Is it ideal? No, but you can do it. It's compelling too. I mean, you get the, uh, the, the everyone all call, always calls it, it's a phantom center. It's, uh, it's that new state of the art technology called stereo. And <laughs> <laughs> it's been working forever and it works really well. You also hit on something big uh, that applies to the, the, the Den and Morant products that I represent. You talked about, you know, does, uh, you, and you talk a lot about it, it's all true. Does the customer skew theater or do they skew music? A lot of that is all that low frequency effect. I mean, the low frequencies in a, in a DTS track are just, I mean, they're right up my alley, they're loud as hell. But for music, they can be a bit overpowered, particularly acoustic music. So there's like little individual settings that you can do in Den and Morantz receivers. Uh, if you set it up right for your customer, you're going to use like quick touch buttons where you can, this literally the customer pushes one button and it toggles between music settings that you set on that EQ curve and movie settings that you set on that same EQ curve. It's not anything that's necessarily new in the receivers. We just made it way easier, easier. to implement, way easier, uh, particularly from a programming standpoint. So if you're programming in, the control four system, you don't have to program in 14 different commands into the, the control four platform. You program those 14 commands once in the Morantz receiver and then program the one command for the quick button in the control floor and it does all the work. So it just makes life easier. But yeah, music and movies, they are they are track different. I mean, you yeah. need to pay attention to the differences between them. And it's synonymous, right? Because that same customer that's asking those questions, he doesn't know. I mean, they, they don't know what to, to assess when a star ceiling is going to cost. They have no idea. I mean, they may have seen a picture somewhere, but they're going right to you. I, so many stories of working on the retail floor where they come in looking for something and without a, a, a at least on a, on a retail floor, you have a, a price tag where they've seen something. They have an idea. Instead of asking the integrator, it's I don't know what a one carat diamond cost. I'm like, one carat diamond cost can range huge I mean, from a colorless, right? Or minimal all the way down. They, they don't know the scale. I don't, I don't know. I need you to help me. I, I, I dude, always did it a good, better, best. Always, no dude, matter what. Dude, I just, I just, it was just my anniversary and I just bought oh. a nice pair of earrings for my wife from my jeweler. Yeah. And I got to taste my own medicine. Like he taught me so many things that I didn't know that made me spend more money. And I didn't want to, but I did it because he had all the tools. I mean, it's not the customer's job to know all this stuff, it's our job. So uh, when you have those opportunities to make someone's life better, uh, and she loves her earrings, so he did a nice job. I'm sure. But it, you know, it is it is one of those things like I spent, I spent a lot more money with the guy than I intended to. But so, wasn't, uh, wasn't it fun though? I mean, there's nothing more fun than when somebody actually knows what they're talking about. So they, they tell you about something. Oh, what about this? And what about this? Do you think you'd like that? It is... When they know their business and they can talk intelligently about it, you're. And let's all let's all be honest with ourselves. We're all salesmen, and salesmen love being sold. We're suckers for a good pitch. We really are, all of us. <laughs> I'll buy based on a good pitch. It's a problem. <laughs> I love like the laughter quick, on that just, one. To, just to kind of put a bow on what Alvin is is you know kind of Alvin's topic here in terms of the components. Um, you know, I think that's that's the benefit of of shopping with Snap One. I mean, we have everything from fantastic value home theater solutions all the way up to you know really high end we've got customizable options we've got you know any anything ranging from your speakers to your subwoofers to your film screens to your projectors to your projector mounts and you know the racks and the mounts and and you know the avrs and you can go everything from a you know value avr solution all the way up to a high-end separate solutions so I think that's kind of the takeaway here there's a couple of questions in the q a around uh, theater seating. I think that's the that's probably the one area that we don't have solutions for. So if anybody has recommendations for a great uh, home theater seating uh, place to get stuff at, please throw it out there. But um, yeah, I think that 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 has been our goal and our mission over the last several years is really to create a one stop shop. So no matter what those qualifying questions are that you have for your uh, end customer, 
we have the product and the solution that you need, ranging from you know multiple different brands that service different different aspects of the market. So, yeah, and with theater seating, like while the uh, the theater seating might not be an option as far as getting getting the theater seats, as far as where to put those seats, you just hit us up because placing the seats in the right spot, not in the middle of the room, is a uh, is key <laughs> to making like a really a really great theater. Two thirds. Two thirds. <laughs> it's too easy too right that's the... that actually came up um that was one of the things that i saw come up in the chat adam you beat me to it but like you i think you hit the nail on the head as far as equalizing like rooms and really choosing like what software like 99 i think you said 99 percent of your work can be done with a tape measure and an fdl meter and that is true uh one of the things that we touched on but didn't really touch on was subwoofer placement um someone asked a question i don't remember who it was but like the corner of the room is where you get the most base, but you get a lot more control. If you're, I, I usually deal with like a third off that, off that exterior wall or a fifth, if that's not possible, just deal in thirds and fifths and you don't create standing waves and get less base. But I found that like either right inside that left, uh, out that left speaker or right outside it. And if you're doing two right inside that right, up to that right speaker or right, right outside and right inside that right speaker, that's usually where you get the best play in most rooms, provided you're, you know, you're working in a, a perfect, you know, nice rectangle with no cubes and then an optimized <laughs> yes. environment like we see all the time. That's every one. Uh, <laughs> right. That's, that's Seth, the customer uh, saying it's going to go there because that's where it's going to be hidden. And you're like, oh, okay. And you're like, Seth, uh, to touch on what you said, uh, Seth, and actually to address another question, which is, about you know an overall you know a starting point for theater design there really isn't one every single room is going to have a different ceiling height different width different depth um i would put a pitch out there uh actually for a book uh by uh, a gentleman named floyd tool which is called sound reproduction uh it's now i think in his 13th version or, or third version third or fourth version uh it's a 30 or 40 dollar book on amazon you don't need to read the whole book. You certainly can if you want to. Uh, but for example, like Seth was saying, for subwoofer placement, there's four or five pages in there that'll show you all the different locations that are really effective uh, based on room size to get either the most base you may want. If you have a, uh, you know, some young customer who just wants the room to shake, then yeah, put all four subs in the corner. If you have someone who yeah. wants the most accurate base they can get, and you want to put the subs more towards the middle of the walls to reduce those triple boundary gains you may get. Uh, that, that book is a great way to learn what scientifically is the best thing you can kind of do in every room you come across. And you're able to always kind of flip to it and just go, okay, hey, this is what I should do here. And after a few times using it, you'll really kind of get a good idea of what's going to work best in every single room. Um, that's what I would recommend to ask your question, Chad about you know what's a good starting point in any room hey, one other one other thing that i would recommend i've been through this course twice in my life now and it is the um the haa course the home acoustics mm -hmm. alliance yeah. with jerry lemay <clears throat> um, he's a fantastic speaker incredibly knowledgeable and he goes through the three stages to the course and and he goes through everything from the theory and the basics all the way through to mm -hmm. some practical application stuff and it, it does include subwoofers so um, a quick plug for the HAA there. Hey, Adam, uh, they were asking, what's the, uh, uh, I think it's Josh, uh, Joshua Lopez was asking, what's the name of that book again? Yep, I'm actually, I'll, I'll, I'm just copying an Amazon link for it just because that's a, a decent place to get it. I'll, uh, I'll sorry, Matt, you don't sell it. Sorry. You like yeah, sorry. It's the one thing uh, that uh, Snap <laughs> One doesn't sell. Sorry. Um, I'm on it. My apologies. I'm on it. <laughs> Um, it is not, it's not like, um, it's not a light read. It is a heavy textbook. It is a textbook. It, it is, is a college level textbook. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic book. So highly recommended as well. I like that. You That's another reason, right? Paper. We're trying to be, trying to be professionals to all of our, any of those things, not only do they lead to our better experience to know as we're designing things on our own, but it also shows the, the customer that technically, you know, we are, as well informed and they're real professional as well. All it takes to be trusted one time, the rest they'll let you do whatever you need in order to make that solution. So, cause they're, they're buying our integrator, right? As the, the pro, it's an important that we make the integrator that, that pro. 
it'd be great too if you're uh, if you're a you know a salesman or an owner and you have a crew of guys. Once you design these systems up a couple times using these 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 pieces, uh, your crew, if they're engaged, are going to start hearing these differences and they're going to be able to make choices down the road on the fly just based on what the room is giving them and it's going to pay dividends. So it's uh yeah the acoustics thing that's. Ah, dude, that's a that's a whole that's a whole week of training with uh, with the Sound United guys for sure. Uh, oh yeah, and at least I mean it's but, a it's a never ending journey. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Uh, and part of that, uh, I'm gonna jump right in. But cool. Um, part of that is, uh, I think, in this world that you know that, that changed just a couple years ago. I mean, it takes a long time for audio guys to adjust to new technology because we get new technology so infrequently. It's, uh, we were dealing with gain adjustments between channels for I don't know how many years. And uh, when Atmos came out, that was the big buzzword. It was also DTSX and you know, all, the, all the other uh, immersive audio formats that are out there. But when it came out, everyone just heard hype speakers. They didn't hear the real star of the show, which was, how the actual mix is created in the studio, which is the whole uh, object-based decoding that you see in so many different, you know, you know, it says it on the side of all of our boxes and you'll see it online in reviews, but it's it, sometimes customers don't really truly understand what it means. So I tell stories. This is when I was, I was, uh, this might be maybe when album was a kid, but Apocalypse Now, if you think back to like, I don't, I don't even want to be rude. I don't even know. If, I don't think you're even that old. This is this is way before I was born, but Apocalypse Now was that first movie that had um, that had surround sound, quote unquote surround sound. It was just four channels: it was front and back. There wasn't the center speaker yet. This is this is the first part, and it's so fun to listen to like the audio engineers tell that story because if you think of the beginning of that movie, it starts off with just smoke, Vietnam smoke, and a helicopter going around in circles and as the helicopter and it moves around the room in a circle and as it comes out of the smoke you hear the doors and the whole movie begins but when you listen to the audio engineers who made that movie sound the way it sounds they said like this is this was them essentially marking their territory that helicopter like this is where this movie is going to take place you're in my world now and it's going to happen right here inside these four walls and that all they were doing was just raising the volume of one and while it simultaneously lowered the volume of a different speaker to make it appear like things were moving, just using imaging between the speakers to move it yeah. throughout the room. And that's the way it was for years, for years. I don't know how many decades. And then everything changed with object-based decoding. And I'm going to nerd out a little bit just because I don't know how to, I don't know how to describe it better, but this is essentially what it looks like on their screen so that all these little dots they're able to program in where things are coming from so that i promise i won't do powerpoint i but it's just something that i just i gotta show you um basically now they're able to not just do gain adjustments between speakers they're able to use multiple speakers in conjunction, think like the way uh, a cell phone tower triangulates your where you are, your GPS coordinates. They're able to do that with audio. Where they're able to do it with the size of something that's moving through the room, whether it be a you know a baseball or a jet engine. They can do how fast it's moving, how well it you know dissipates throughout the space. Uh, they can go from one part of they can move around in the individual space. So it's a lot different now when you're talking about processing capabilities of these new receivers than it was before. You're not just doing gain adjustments. So as far as designing the space and having the right number of speakers in the room, where before you would over clutter a room with too many speakers and you can still do that, it's a lot more forgiving now with object-based decoding uh, because you're gonna be able to use multiple speakers to tri triangulate where they are. Here's one of the, uh, the problems you're gonna run into with customers. I shouldn't say you're a problem you're gonna run into with customers. We know the, the objections they give you, they're legit and they don't, it's because they don't understand the technology because why would they? They don't sit around and go to webinars, snap one webinars during their work day. <laughs> this is not what they do. So one of the things that you're gonna get, and I'm sure you've gotten from customers who have a surround sound system, modest surround sound system, TV mounts above the fireplace, one, two, three speakers up front, two speakers in the, in the surround. They're buying a new receiver 
and it has seven channels and they look at you like well why i don't i only have five speakers why do i need seven channel receiver i don't i don't need seven channels i only have five speakers so let me get the less expensive thing and if you don't have a good answer for that it's one of the things to remember it's, you know it is there the benefits for you when you're selling AV gear is if you have a multi-channel receiver, ours go up to 13 channels, uh, 13 channels of processing, 11 channels of amplification. If you have that many channels of amplification and you don't use any more than five, you're still getting benefits because the processor inside those receivers is going to be able to decode more objects. So if they go with that regular run of the mill, let's call it like a 3,700 from Denon or like a 2,700 from Denon, you know, they're not going to get the benefit of DTSX Pro, for example. DTSX Pro can take 30 channels of information, 30.2 uh, to be exact, and it can distribute that metadata to your five speakers, giving you better placement within that space without you buying more speakers. But if you don't go with those flagship products, you're only going to get 11 channels of processing. So the customer is going to miss out on 20, 2019 uh, channels of, uh, ample of, of information that's already in the metadata of whatever it is they're watching. Yep, it's a real so cinema it's, mix. You're right. Yeah. Right. It's built into there. Um, this isn't, it's nice too, because you, this, is, this is built into whatever's there. So I don't need to go and rebuy Star Wars Blu rays for the <laughs> fourth time. Like it, it's, all, it's all in there. We just have to be able to extract it. And the better receivers can do that. So just because the customer has less, you know, less speakers than what the processing capabilities or even the amplification capa capabilities that you're giving uh, the particular speakers uh, doesn't mean that they're not going to get tremendous advantages in their space with less speakers. You notice it, especially with five. I mean, you can just get stuff moving around the room. It's crazy. So and we all, uh, there's a bunch of other tricks too, like you can do, for, and that's one of the, oh, so back to that, um, <laughs> that's an object-based decoding world. You can play tricks now. I'm a, I'm a purist. I'm an old school dude. I can't get out of my own head. It's, it's not my fault. I was, I was, I was raised poorly in the audio industry. Anything virtualized, I immediately put my nose up at. I'm not a fan of, you know, simulated anything. I get that phasing tech, but object-based decoding changed that. So now with all of that metadata that's there, I can virtually fix all, and we actually have it built into Denon and Moran's receiver, a speaker virtualizer. You can virtually simulate height speakers. And it is wild what just five speakers, seven speakers at your level can simulate from a height perspective, as well as like a, just a good pair of speakers. We can simulate as far as height speakers can do, all because of this object-based decoding phenomenon we have. Uh, it's, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of different um, encoding that goes out there as far as the different formats that are available or 3d imax enhanced uh dtsx pro dolby atmos we have them all in all of our receivers you're gonna you're gonna support all of them uh how many channels of processing that you get like dtsx pro is going to depend on which model that you buy but a customer wants the most enveloped stage receiver and having the ability to get that data out and play with it uh is is paramount so um and now I know we're talking power. I know nothing against Paulie and his one watt to move speakers, which is awesome. But also, we also have the ability uh, to, to add external power. So if you're talking about getting the most out of your speakers, even something as efficient as the clip stuff, uh, having external amplifiers is huge. Uh, so if you look at our top models and you see a 13.2 channels of amplification, of, of processing, 13.2 channels of processing, but only 11 channels of ampl uh, amplification. If you've got a 13 channel speaker system, that's just an advantage. That's just an opportunity for you to amplify the most important speakers and sound systems up front, give the customer not only better re reproduction of movies, but get that front sound stage just rocking with a dedicated stereo amp running off of that receiver to run your front. And then I saw I saw Alvin. He was doing the little money. Thing. Money, yeah, baby. <laughs> money, more money. Well, yeah. and there's nothing better than stepping up, right? I mean, that's, that's to your point. That's a, we we want to get our our customer with a product that we can always add on to, and that we, we want him calling back about, oh, hey, I, I saw X, right, and that I want to add to, or I want to I want to add that bathroom, or I, I want to do whatever. You know, whatever those things are, it's that's the yeah, next yeah. step, customer for a lifetime. And 
Caesar brought up just brought up a good question. I'm going to answer this live because I, I don't want this to come off. I, I'm going to use I'm going to talk about my branches and my brands, but I don't want this to be necessarily about my brands. It's more about the sales practice of selling better audio gear. I'm going to use Morant specifically because the Morant 5015 is our best selling receiver because it's our least expensive receiver. That's you know that that makes sense. Morant is that aspirational brand that people want. They strive to own. It's that next level up from, you know, the other, you know, the, the other brands that are, that are available. It's something that, you know, we get stories all the time. People pass their Morant equipment down to their kids. And the 5015 is, you know, it's a whole bunch of channels. It's got all the decoding. It's got HDMI 2.1. It's got Helios. It's got Bluetooth. It's got everything that I want. And it's the cheapest one. I'll take that one. That's the conversation that you can have with that customer Caesar is well that's a great option and the 5015 is going to drive you know going to drive those those clip speakers or those cast speakers that you're buying from snap one perfectly fine but if you jump up to the 6015 you're going to get pre-amp and you're going to get pre-amplifier mode meaning you can take the 6015 home just like you take the 5015 home today play with it and then in three months down the road you come back and get an amplifier from me plug it in, pop that receiver in pre-amplifier mode, it'll shut down all those internal amps, and it'll be like you got new goddamn speakers because you're getting real power. I mean, we all remember the first time. I remember the first time I heard, like, when I, when I first owned real power, like, I only had receivers before, and some from work, I had a big, I think it was Rotel, a big monster boat anchor, like 350 watts by two, it was a hammer, and uh, I plugged into my existing receiver, and it was like, I, I felt cheated like what have i been doing with my life this this whole time it was so <laughs> much another, <better. laughs> another another great reason another great reason Seth, to go with you know quote unquote separates is you've got dedicated power you've got dedicated processing you just talked about how processing technology has changed over the years well you may you know you may have a, a preference in terms of a certain type of sound you may want more power through your power amplifiers and the ability to upgrade your processing over time um, by having separate components will also allows you to do that. So, you know, we've got yeah. um, Parasound uh, dedicated power amplifiers that you can put, you know, Marantz preprocessors in front of those um, to power some, you know, really, really high end heavy speakers. Typically, the more power, the more current you provide to a speaker, the better it sounds. Um, obviously, you can change the technology of the amplification, whether it's, you know, a traditional class D amplifier to going to more of your old school class AB amplification. So just, you know, stepping up from a, a, an all in one box to a solution where you really have dedicated things for dedicated parts of the job, um, you know, can help improve that experience and then also can help improve you as Elvin did before, uh, make a little bit more money as, as you upsell that project. So great, great options there. Again, kind of all the way from that value to that high end. Yeah, and shout out to the Parasound. I was in a, um, I was in a customer's house who was uh, in a well-known R&B uh, group. His name uh, was Wyclef. And, uh, he had, his daughters blew the hell out of his system. I mean, drivers flew across the room. I mean, and if I ever did that to my dad's system, I would have been like hiding in the corner and they were like, yeah, we were rocking. And, but uh, blew up his speakers. So I was there fixing speakers and he had a whole rack of power, Parasound stuff for I think it was like 13 channels in his dedicated theater. And it was, that stuff's awesome. That stuff really ripped. Nice job on Parasound. Well, we, uh, we, got, we got about 60 seconds left of our, um, allocated time here but there's um there's a there's a question that we've got here from patrick that i wanted to cover really quickly before we uh, before we um switch off for the day but uh, here's a question what are examples of customer objections you've had in your careers when trying to sell a home theater versus the typical um in ceiling mixed use room that most clients default to for example getting the customer to make the jump to a proper cinema room from just the surround sound system in a family room. So um, the, this example is gonna be existing retrofit projects, not new constructions. Existing well, I mean, if there, yeah. yeah, if there's no desire for them to have that experience, you're, you know, you're, there, there has to be a purchasing desire in that customer. And so if, 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 if they're saying, yeah, like the theater behind me, yeah, no interest. I don't sit at an objection. They're just looking for a media room. They're looking for a multi-purpose room. Um, right. So outside I would, of outside of room I, acoustics and and maybe lighting, mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty fair to say that we can make a pretty incredible 
audio experience in a room that is a more family media room Heck yeah. style, right? We can still, we some can still my, go pretty big. Some of my favorite. Yeah, just because it looks like a living room. Yeah, exactly. Just because it looks like a living room doesn't mean it's not going to be amazing. So take it and run with it. I mean, you know, like, okay, this is a, this is a game room. Let's give you goosebumps. Let's figure out how to do it. Yeah, I think that's a really important point in, in all of these conversations that you don't have to have a dedicated space to have a movie room. No. You, you can sell a movie room to somebody who has a multi-purpose living room and make it sound absolutely fantastic. And get, uh, get creative with it. If you look at, uh, again, some of the technologies that you have available uh, from the guys on this panel, you've got some unbelievably great uh, in-wall and in-ceiling speakers that just they disappear until you turn them on and they melt your face off. You also have, uh, through the Morants and the Den receivers, you have multi-video um, uh, multi, uh, outputs. So you can have that TV mounted on the wall, you know, inconspicuously, just like a normal media room. But then up in the soffit, you can hide in that, that projector screen, program into the programming when it's time to watch a movie, that projector screen comes down out of the ceiling. It switches to that other yep. HDMI output and you get the benefits of a giant screen that goes away when you don't want to see it and real speakers that always sound good. You know, you can, you can make some really good, smart and creative uh, mm -hmm. choices in design uh, to give, to, to basically to give customers what they want, but then you still get to do what you want and deliver an overall better experience. The customer at the end of the day is going to be happy with. Mm -hmm. And we got what, one more question worth touching on. I think this might be one for you, Seth. So Reginald's asking um, if we're going to be using a second or third HDMI output on on one uh, on a receiver. Um, do we need edit emulators in the project? One of the things that I run into is you know you have sometimes yeah sometimes if they if you're getting crosstalk, it's basically they have to identify each other back through that just that EDA just shuts up the middleman and uh, it makes that just a one-to-one -one connection which is nice um uh the, a lot of the time whenever you're running into uh the need for those i i hear the the situation where i run into it the most is whenever people are um using balins uh, and powering them using the hot port on the tv mm -hmm. um you're going to get voltage drops on that potentially uh depending on uh whose balin you're using uh, so if you ever run into that, there are some products out there that uh, solve that voltage issue. I can dig them up while we're uh, while we're waiting. Uh, but you shouldn't need necessarily need uh, an EDID emulator in that project. It should be able to differentiate between the two. But if you run into a situation where it's giving you problems, swap swap on that EDID just uh, emulated like you did before, and it'll solve it for you. Fantastic, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I think we've answered the majority of the questions here. Um, in in the chat so um i think we're probably at a point where we can wrap this up for now so uh guys thank you um for coming and sharing your knowledge with us thanks everybody who's joined us um here and dialed in we've had incredible attendance and um everyone stuck around the whole time which makes me really happy um don't forget we got two more of these so next week we've got the video one um, and then the week after that we're going stalling it right and we're going to be going into um, a little more depth um on both of those so um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks again. Remember, you can buy it online. You can come and shop in our local stores. We've got an incredible selection of really very beautiful sounding audio equipment that you've got to check out. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to Gary to uh, close us out. Yeah, guys, I, you know, this was such a great dialogue. I think we're hitting our strides right now. We could definitely extend this thing another hour and a half. But <laughs> unfortunately, you guys are so expensive to get on this show that it's just it's tough yeah. to coordinate. I mean, you guys are the best of the best. But you did commit to coming back here in four more hours. So go get your lunch and get your butts back in here because we're going to do this again. And I urge every, anybody, if you had to bail out or you've got team members that you want to have attend today, register today, and we're going to continue this conversation. But guys, really quick, to sum this up, I think the sum up or I think the takeaway was really selling the experience. Adam, you did such a great job. I, the line that you said about surfacing the customer info really resonated with me. And it meant our positioning and our posturing to allow that conversation to have happen. You guys saw, and thank you guys for manning the, the questions here because a lot of them were really based on that dialogue in our, our comfort zone and in, in, in making this 
are taking these these projects to the next level. Thank you so much on that. Um, yeah, Seth, so your speaker placement and multi-channel amplification, thank you so much on that. Matt, you talked about a little bit about um, some of the reference designs that you have been privy to. Guys, anything you want me to get in the follow-up email, which is gonna be in their inbox Friday, you get to me. I'll package it up, think about it over the next couple of days and and um, get me some, some more uh, uh, assets that I can put into the email, links, whatever. Yeah, like that book link, I got that as well. So thank you for that. I'll put that in my follow-up. Uh, Alvin, you're, you're upselling and, and on the ways and, and you know, some of the stuff that you have experience with. And thank you for your, your comfort in, in helping us with that dialogue. Great, great stuff today, guys. We're going to continue this in four more hours, like I said. Um, everybody look for your uh, email on Friday morning. And yes, as David alluded to, um, you know, the, we are the SNAP local community. We're here for you. We've got counters. We've got experts. And uh, we're going to continue to train you guys each and every Wednesday. I expect everybody back here to complete this series next Wednesday and the Wednesday after that. Sign up today. We'll pass it to your team. We're all about uh, helping you guys out. And um, what a great dialogue. What a, what a healthy discussion today. David, Adam, Alvin, Seth, and Matt. Thank you, brothers. Thank you so much. We'll catch you a little bit later on today. Make sure you go to our webinar, uh, uh, YouTube, to uh, our archive and our, our webinars, and you'll see everything that we've covered over the last year. Here for you from all of us at the SNAP Locals, SNAP One. Thank you so much. Stay safe out there, guys. Take care. Peace. Thanks. Cheers. See you.